Xanthoastrocytoma. He was 17 years old. After several surgeries, massive chemotherapy, and radiation treatments that are no longer recommended, John was left per uh, permanently disabled. With a partial paralysis of his left leg requiring a brace to walk and full paralysis of his left arm. That was the physical toll the surgeries and treatments had taken. What weren't visible at the time were the cognitive and social tolls to come. In his 20s, John graduated from Ohio Northern, degree, Ohio Northern University with a degree in sports management. And he was able to live fairly independent in a small home in downtown Belmont, close to family. He held jobs at the YMCA, started a small landscaping business at one time, and actually worked here at Trigger Valley Country Club. But as John begins his 30s, high school and college friends have moved on with their lives. The marquee signs at the high school and hardware store saying, Go Whitey, have, cha have long changed. And John begins his real world journey. It is at this time the invisible effects of traumatic brain injury caused by the surgeries and treatments begin to become more apparent for John. The portion of his brain that had been removed, you see, left John with no short-term memory. This would become worse as John aged, making the use of cell phones, computers, the internet, things we take for granted, nearly impossible. His memory development was frozen at the age of 17. That part of the brain also controlled his social cues, leaving him with a form of Tourette's with having no filter on the things that he would say, and his social development never really progressed past the age of 17. As many of you may have experienced, particularly if you're at Macintosh's, John would sit and tell you a story in great detail of a baseball game he may have played in 1982, but yet he would struggle to remember if he had taken a shower or had eaten anything that day. And the ability for family and friends to understand these gradual changes can be very hard. This was okay in the first decade or so after surgeries. Belbrook remembered John's story and embraced him. But as John aged and the same stories and told the same stories over and over, some of that charm had faded. Along with the understanding of what John and others with traumatic brain injury struggle with every hour of every day. Belbrook grew and the faces changed, and soon no one remembered that baseball star that had beat cancer. John lived independently after our mother passed away. But things became harder for him. He was less understood and less socially acceptable. And for John, lonely, loneliness becomes a daily chore. As John aged physically in his 40s and 50s, his muscular build declined, much as we all do. However, with his traumatic brain injury, this decline was accelerated. His foot drop became more apparent, affecting his balance and making short walks very difficult. The weight of his paralyzed arm and the paralysis of his left side caused his spine to curve, causing chronic back pain. It was becoming apparent to the family that John was struggling physically. He was reluctant to use the cane, and even after additional physical therapy, John began to, began to fall more than we ever realized. He was embarrassed and afraid to tell us that he had fallen, and his falls became more severe and occurred more than we ever, ever knew. Emergency room visits became more than normal as John turned 50. With each fall, there would be a new head trauma. The result would be the pendulum of a recovery would never swing back to where it was previously. His medical baseline of physical and cognitive abilities would be lowered with each new head trauma. John was struggling cognitively at this time and physically, but where does a 17-year-old boy and a 50-year-old body turn to? Where does that family turn to when we see John's decline is far more than the average 50-year-old man? Every day became a struggle for John simply to reach the end of that day, only to repeat that struggle the next day. And this struggle takes its toll not only on John, but those who want the best for their loved one, but don't know where to turn, don't have their proper resources to try and make it better. At the age of 54, John ended up in a nursing home because he had lost the ability to care for himself. Why? We never really understood why. Was it because of the traumatic brain injury at 17? Was it the early onset of dementia because of the TBI? Was it all the radiation he had? We thought maybe a Lewy body dementia. 
When we ask doctors why the frustrations of being dismissed as just normal aging mounted. We don't really know why John rests so quickly, and sometimes that's a terrible, helpless feeling. John's life ended June 27th, 2022, at the age of 56. The official cause of this death was a hemorrhagic stroke, which is just a fancy medical term for bleeding on the brain due to yet another traumatic brain injury. So that is John's story in five minutes. I could go on much longer, but you guys need to keep kicking my button trivia to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the real reason we're all here tonight is help move closer to the first of its kind traumatic brain injury center in a, could be in our very own backyard. What I think what that would meant for John and other families affected by TBI, for the region as a whole, several words come to mind. Resources, understanding, acceptance, encouragement, coaching, companionship, socialization. My brother would have benefited greatly from a social outlet with others that understood his difficulties. The availability of coaching and encouragement to stay physically active with others with similar disabilities would have been a great asset. The family would have had an ally and a resource partner to ask others in similar situations how they dealt with issues of traumatic brain injury, such as insurance or doctors, counseling, or a better understanding of socialization issues. Our family can't help to wonder if we had more knowledge and understanding, would John's life have turned out differently than just a little bit better? As his brother, I certainly believe it would have. I'm proud to be a tiny part of this group, Mark. And I thank Payne, the Sigmund family, and all those that are working so hard to make this center a reality. And lastly, I need to thank the many people of Bellbrook that helped my brother John in so many different ways over his life. It truly took a village. So thank you and keep supporting the Play for Pain Foundation.